Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, afternoon. Um, we are going to talk today about Build.com and how we're leveraging AWS and our migrations to the cloud. Technically, we're a startup, uh, but we've been around for about 12 or 13 years now. So we actually have a lot of legacy equipment on our own on-premise data centers. And so this is going to talk about our journey to the cloud and what we're doing. Cool. This is our agenda. What we're going to do is talk a little bit about payments. Payments you might think are really boring, uh, but it's not. It's actually very interesting. Uh, so we're going to dive into that. And then we're going to talk a little bit of how uh, our team is leveraging AWS to actually drive innovation for the company. We have a lot of business initiatives and things we want to do, but we can't do it um, if we're not leveraging the cloud. We're going to talk about our current state for our data centers. Uh, as well as how we're adopting uh, services in AWS, uh, especially around uh, machine learning and data lakes. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the future and where we're going. Awesome. So this is build.com. This is what we do. Uh, this is what a payment looks like. This is like old school payment. If you look at this slide, there's a lot of chaos, right? And I think that's intentional. So the way payments are, it's very complicated. It's very manual. When I was growing up, uh, my parents owned a restaurant, and my uh, mom was the bookkeeper. She was in charge of all the books. And she would have all the checks, and she'd write the checks, and she'd, she'd call my dad and be like, hey, should I pay this vendor? Should I pay this uh, person for the food or whatever it is? Uh, and then she'd write checks all the time. And it amazes me today, in 2019, how many small businesses are still operating that way. They're using spreadsheets. They're using Excel. They're writing paper checks. They're, they're running around the office and say, hey, will you pay this bill? Uh, it's very manual. There's a lot of running around. Uh, all these little uh, fancy uh, paper airplanes are all over the place. Um, you're doing inter-office mail. You're actually doing email, snail mail, faxes, all these different things. There's a lot of paper, and it's not efficient. It is not a great way to run your business. Everything is complicated. So Bill.com has come in uh, to help assist with this process. Now this slide is very calm, right? So this is the bill.com way. For us, we focus on a paperless system. And for us, that means that you can accept bills uh, on our platform in an automated fa fashion. So instead of getting a paper bill in the mail and then maybe typing it in somewhere, you can get it through an email and automatically place it into your inbox so that you can categorize it. This is very strategic for us because we do want to be paperless. It's important for the back office that we don't have to worry about it. We then view and approve your bills. So in general, for a small business, as you get to a certain size, the person who's getting the bill is not the same person that's going to pay it. It's not the same person that's going to approve it. So our system automates that entire workflow for paying bills. And then we're efficient. So once you decide to pay a bill, everything is done through ACH. Uh, we also can send checks uh, if needed, but ultimately uh, we try to do everything automated, everything ACH, and then secure. So all of the systems on the back end are synchronized into your accounting software so that if you are a small business owner, you want your QuickBooks, for example, to match uh, the bill payments that you've made in bill.com. For us, we have two major uh, initiatives around machine learning learning in order to automate this pipeline. We're going to dive into some of that soon. OK. All that simple workflow actually generates a very large payment volume for us. So a little bit behind the curtain, uh, for us, we're operating at about $60 billion a year. That's a lot of money. We're one of the top providers of money movers inside of California. We have to be money transmitter licensed in all 50 states. Um, and so it's very important for us. Obviously, security is very important. Performance is very important. Availability, we have a bunch of compliance. Uh, we work with a lot of banks. Uh, we work with a lot of government agencies. Uh, we have to worry about fraud. That's a lot of money to move through the system, and it's important that we do it efficiently and securely. Second, payment transactions. We're flowing about 12 million payment transactions through the system every year. What that means is, on our side, we have to ensure that there's no fraud, there's no, anti there's no money laundering people. like. It would be awful for people to use our system for money laundering. So what we use is machine learning in order to automate the ability to see whether or not uh, there is fraud occurring, that the transaction is safe. It goes beyond just the simple rules of, does this payment look suspicious, and actually leverage 
uh, machine learning algorithms to determine that. And then documents. So many documents. We, we upload, our customers upload about 4 million documents a month. Sometimes I joke with people that we're more like a Dropbox or a Box.com than a payments company like PayPal because of the amount of documents that are inflown into our systems. Documents could be things like a bill, which is kind of obvious, but it could be like a contract, information about a vendor, like, a con like something that you want to have to remember uh, and keep into our system. So four million of these documents, terabytes of documents are uploaded into our system every month, and our customers expect these documents to be automatically categorized. At the keynote this morning, they talked about um, you know, some of the expensive, you know, the, the, when you're doing expenses, you want it to automate your expenses. It's the same with your bills. When a bill comes into the system, you don't want to sit around and say, oh, what's the due date? What's, how much is this bill? You know, what is the invoice date? All that information should be automatically generated. So we use machine learning in order to do that categorization so that customers have a frictionless uh, experience for uploading those documents. Now that you kind of understand what bill.com does, these are the, the high level problems that we're actually trying to solve. So the first is improved customer experience. Talked about this a little bit. Zero data entry. When someone's uploading a document, we can't, we, we can't manually go through. We don't want secondary providers to go through and manually enter the document details. The second is faster onboarding. When we have new customers onto the platform, we want them to synchronize with their accounting software as, as fast as possible. We want them to integrate their vendors, make recommendations like, hey, you're a small business. Maybe you pay Comcast. Do you want to pay Comcast? This looks like a Comcast bill. How about you pay it? And the, second, and the third is the better risk and decision models, which means when a transaction is flowing th through the system, are we actually tagging it for fraud? Are we making sure that we're manually reviewing it? Um, because as we grow with that amount of payment volumes, humans cannot possibly look at every single one of those transactions. We have to rely on machine learning in order to do that. The next is ex expand globally. Bill.com announced that we do international payments the last few months ago, uh, where uh, our US-based companies can pay internationally in whatever, um, you know, wherever you're going. Like if you're paying in pounds or euros, our system will do that for you. But we're currently not, we currently do not have customers internationally. And so as a part of our st strategy, we have to be able to do that. We have to be able to grow our company to be able to add international customers and lastly, competitive differentiation, right? We want to be innovative, uh, especially on the fintech side. OK, those business goals drive uh, into AWS. What, how are we going to use AWS to actually achieve these primary objectives for, especially with an engineering and our product goals? Uh, the first is to use AWS for scale, so that we, and we're going to dive into more about how we're going to scale vertically and horizontally that way. We're going to leverage it for data science, uh, AI and machine learning, and then we're going to leverage it for blockchain uh, and fintech. Fintech essentially means like the next generation of payment rails. How are we actually going to make payments? Uh, Apple Pay announced their thing this week. Um, you know, it's a new way to make payments. Bill.com has to be an innovator on this uh, in order to uh, compete in the market. All right, this is what our data centers look like today. We have four data centers. We have a corporate data center here in Palo Alto. We have a primary data center in Sunnyvale. We have a disaster recovery site in Phoenix. And then because we follow the rule of threes, just like with AWS, we have a third data center in San Luis Obispo. All it is is data. We only put data in San Luis Obispo. I bet you didn't know they had data centers in San Luis Obispo, but apparently they do. We keep the data there as a third. That way, if Sunnyvale were to, I, I shouldn't use the term blow up, but if Sunnyvale were to say, like, lose power, and we had to flip to Phoenix, then we can keep the data replicated to San Luis Obispo and ensure data replication for all our customers. This is what our application framework looks like. We are built on Java. Just like most applications that were built over a decade ago, Java is the platform uh, that a lot of these things were built. So we are not currently serverless. Uh, we run on Java. We use Resin as our container. Uh, we use HTML5, AngularJS for our front end applications. Uh, and then we primarily drive on Linux. 
we have a horizontally scalable platform where we have front-end applications, back-end APIs, batch processing, image processing, payment processing, all these different processing. Um, so you can kind of think of them as microservices, but ultimately there are different components to do. So for most of our application, if we need more services, we can simply scale horizontally, get more services, you know, add more Nutanix boxes and be able to scale that way. But at some point, we're not going to be able to do that anymore. Our database server can only get so large. And as we grow as a company, there's no way that we can scale it to, say, 10 times the amount of customers that we have today. Uh, so we also look into uh, potting, which we're going to talk about soon. OK, this is how we're leveraging AWS today. We have our on-prem data center. This sort of uh, picture with all the beautiful colors, we call this a pod. Some people call it a cluster, which is also fine. Uh, but it's a set of application servers and backend database infrastructure that compose a set of customers. right? All of that is inside our data centers. We then have a hybrid cloud into AWS where we're leveraging SageMaker for all of our machine learning. We use SageMaker for actually training our models. We use SageMaker for uh, all of our um, notebook and like data analysis and understanding what's going on. And then we actually use SageMaker to do inference on the models. So real time in production, we can actually call from our data centers into AWS in order to do model inference on live transactions. We run Athena and Redshift for our uh, data lake analysis so that when we're as a part of the machine learning process and then uh, soon in analytics with some of the other tools and Tableau and other things to actually get visibility into your data. Uh, but ultimately today SageMaker is the cornerstone of all of our AWS. Build.com is moving into the cloud. Uh, the days like I've been managing data centers for a long time. I kind of joke with people that I'm a recovering rack hugger, right? I love they, I love to touch servers, right? They're just, they're so stable, right? They just work. But those days are over. For companies our size, it does not make sense for us to operate inside of our own data centers perpetually. We are on a, we are on a journey to the cloud. The way that that looks today is that we have our own data centers uh, located um, you know, where I showed. And then as we build out the next pods, they're going to be built out within AWS. That includes building the next pod in AWS, as well as including international pods, as well as a migration of our existing equipment into AWS. Cool. There you go. That's it. Any questions? Yes. You mentioned about uh, leveraging on the blockchain type of a structure. Yes. Yeah, so uh, he asked, are we leveraging blockchain? So we are, we are evaluating blockchain as a fintech solution for the company because, I mean, obviously there's a lot of folks in the industry. Uh, there are definitely uh, practical applications for what we do. Uh, today we are a closed payment system, uh, so we don't necessarily need it today, but it's something that we're looking at. Will you, be, uh, 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 will you use a blockchain on your, uh, in your own data, uh, data center, or you move it to the completely It would be cloud fully, data? yeah. So all new services are going to be built inside of AWS, and that includes blockchain. Would that be a private chain or a public chain? It'd likely be, well, I don't know. I can't answer that. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. Well, I like to tell, well, I, I have your bill. <laughs> yeah. I have your, OK, thank you. Um, any other questions? All right, well, you can. <laughs> He's copied it down. Well, he'll be a. <laughs> okay. Right, so can we repeat the question? Do you think moving to the public cloud make things cheaper operationally? Yeah. So my uh, AWS account manager is here. Uh, he is going to ensure that that is the case. <laughs> uh, we have done a, a lot of extensive analysis with AWS to determine that, and at this point, yeah, it's absolutely a cost savings for us to leverage the cloud. Um, in addition to just a cost savings, it's also the normal sort of productivity increases, uh, you know, development productivity, all of the normal stuff you get from moving to the cloud. Yep. Great. <laughs> is, is there any other questions or? <laughs> One second. There's a guy behind you who wants the first. Hello, Kai. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that uh, move to AWS from the on-prem. Uh, how do you decide the 
the priority when you're moving things over. Obviously, you cannot do one all in once. What's the strategy to moving? Yeah, so our strategy to move is uh, initially, it's establishing new services in AWS so that we can build that muscle. Right, so that we feel confident with building new services. Uh, and then we actually, a lot of those uh, microservices I showed, those are going to move one at a time um, in hybrid cloud. So we have a direct connect with our data center, uh, which essentially will extend that network into the cloud to make us have a lot of, enough confidence to run in a dual stack mode for a while until we can actually migrate everything. Yeah. OK, thank you. <laughs> OK, second chance. Uh, uh, a question I have is uh, a lot of uh, uh, examples uh, throughout my own professional career uh, showed us that uh, uh, COBOL will never die. COBOL will never <laughs> die, yeah. Uh, uh, do you see Java in a similar trail? Do I think, no, Java will never die. <laughs> uh, but who knows? I mean, you never, yeah. So, so when you migrate to uh, the cloud, will you uh, change to a more modern uh, yeah, so a language? Lot, yeah, so a lot of the new services are being built on newer platforms. Um, some, of the, some of the new services, they're definitely looking at Lambda to use as well for fully serverless. Um, we're also leveraging containers, um, and, but essentially Java is still, it's still a beast, right? It still can do a lot. So I don't expect it to go away anytime soon. OK, thank you. Yeah. Other question over here? So uh, being a fintech or financial services company, what were the challenges from compliance point of view when you mo moved the data outside of your control, as yeah. well as you mentioned about going cross-border payments? Yep. What are the issues you see with things like GDPR yep. and yep. how the, where the data is kept and yep. how it's yeah. moved? Yeah, so we deal with a lot of compliance. We deal, like I mentioned, with money transmitter licenses. We have to be PCI certified. Uh, we also deal with a lot of secondary uh, compliance requirements from the banks that we work with. Um, we worked a lot with AWS to ensure that the, uh, for example, the data lake is utilizing all the best practices. And then we spend a lot of time partnering with them to help them understand all of the security controls we have. Um, we leverage the CIS benchmarks uh, is one of the big things that we use in order to make sure that, especially as we're building it, to make sure that it's built properly from the ground up for security. Um, our company already has been, uh, has had compliance and security a core part for so long. Uh, I'd say 80 to 90% of our controls that were in the data center are actually mapping really easily into the cloud, which originally I thought would be hard. Uh, but it's actually turned out that most, most of our controls will actually map really easily. Um, there's just a few that are harder. Um, and then obviously, once we actually get into the cloud, there's actually a lot more uh, that we can do. Um, but the initial goal was to map everything. Uh, I call it feature parity, right? So feature on the security control side, ensure that everything we're doing on-prem is there in the cloud, and then build off of that. So all, I mean, there's thousands of security controls. Uh, but yeah, yeah. That's, that's the strategy.